Okay, now let's talk about bias. There are a lot of things to watch out for when you are getting people to be in your study or when you're asking people questions as part of an observational study. There are a lot of places where you can accidentally introduce some bias and we want to avoid that. Bias is any time that you have like a variable you didn't anticipate that sort of gets in the way of your response variable. For example, convenience sampling. We already mentioned this. If you do a convenience sample, you're just picking the people who are convenient, the people who are close to you or the people who are easy to access. That sample might not accurately represent your population and so that's a source of bias. You're missing opinions um, that you would get if you took a random sample. One that we haven't talked about yet is called voluntary response. So this is where participation in your study is optional or voluntary. The problem with voluntary response is you're only getting the people who have strong opinions. It does feel like in 2020 that's everyone. Let's say someone says, go to our website if you want to participate in our survey about whether or not masks are effective at preventing the spread of COVID. Um, there's going to be a lot of people that fill out that survey. You're probably most likely to get the people who feel really strongly in both directions because you have to volunteer to participate. The people who are neutral or the people who don't care that much aren't going to take the time to fill out that survey because they have to go to a website, click a link, write down their feelings. The people who are going to volunteer their time to do that are only the ones who feel strongly about either opinion. So that's the problem with voluntary response. If you leave it as a voluntary optional thing, you're only getting the people who really care and you're missing the people who don't. Okay, let's stop thinking about the virus. Um, I wanna know if more people in my city support placing more bike racks downtown. Let's use this example to see two other sources of bias. If I were to ask only people waiting at bus stops downtown, this is called under coverage because I'm only asking people who take public transportation. I am missing people who drive their own cars Ironically, I'm missing people who bike. Um, I'm missing pedestrians. I'm only getting people who take the public buses. Under coverage is any time that you take a sample and your sample is missing large chunks of the population. If my population is like all students at my school and I only sample AP students, I'm missing a very large chunk of my population. I'm missing all of the non-AP students. So under coverage is when you're missing part of your population. Same bike scenario, I send surveys to a random selection of households in the city, but most don't respond. This is called non-response, and this is also not good because my population is not being accurately represented, and this is kind of tied in with the voluntary response. I'm only gonna get the people who have the time to like mail the postcard back to me or go to my website and fill out my survey or whatever it is. But non-response is if you send out a bunch of surveys and you only get like 20 or 30% of them back. Okay. Response bias is just kind of general bias that could come in for a number of reasons. So one way that you have response bias is if your survey is not anonymous. But if your topic is anywhere close to being kind of touchy and you're not surveying people anonymously, you're going to have issues. Anything about like salary, mental health, physical health, honestly, um, political views, any of that, if it's not anonymous, people might not be willing to share true information. Being intimidating or giving off a judgmental vibe while um, administering a survey can also result in some response bias. I used to show those Jimmy Kimmel clips um, where they would just ask people on the street questions and they would make people feel pressured to answer a certain way. How do you feel about today's big announcement that North Korea will be joining the U.S. as the 51st state? Were you excited when you heard that news? Um, not really. I mean, kind of, but not really. I usually don't show those in class anymore because like totally honest, they just bum me out. But the way that an interviewer is asking a question can result in some response bias. Variation in interviews is also a problem. If you are giving a survey verbally, you have to make sure that you have the same delivery every time so that you're not like really nice and open and kind to one person and then mean and judgmental and like rushed to somebody else. A really good example is, did you vote? There's a way to ask that nicely, and there's a way to ask that that is subtly judgy. Okay, another common source of bias is the wording of the question. So a confusing question is going to be hard for people to understand, hard for people to answer, and you're going to get some bad answers just because they don't understand what you're asking. Can I ask you a few questions? Would you say that you are enjoying yourself and having fun, having 
a moderate amount of fun and somewhat enjoying yourself or having no fun and no enjoyment? I'm going to put a lot of fun. Slanted questions are when you ask a question and it's very clear what you want the answer to be. Wouldn't you agree, like most decent Americans, that it would be a good idea to turn the abandoned lot on Sullivan Street into a beautiful community park? Oh, actually, no, I'm not really a fan of parks. Would you change your mind if I told you that 9 out of 10 meth users said the same exact thing? What? How would you even know that? Survey. It's obvious what she wants you to say. When you're asked to explain bias, it's less important that you can remember the name or the vocab, like non-response or under coverage. It's more important that you can explain what the bias is and identify a direction. So don't get too hung up on memorizing all the vocab I just showed you. Um, instead, focus your energy on explaining what the bias is and which direction the bias is going to take your data. For example, uh, the parent of a football player is concerned about proposed budget cuts to the athletic program, so she asks um, spectators at a game if they agree with the proposed cuts. So let's not worry about any of the vocab. The problem with this is she's only asking people that are at football games. And who's more likely to be at football games? People who would support money for a football program. What you want to do is not just say, this is biased because she's only talking to people who like football. You want to say what that's going to do to her data. Because she's only talking to people who care about football, she's going to get more responses that are against the budget cuts. The technical term here would be under coverage. She's missing everyone who doesn't attend football games. Um, but once again, the vocab is not as important as you explaining what the bias is and which direction the bias goes. So on the last page of these notes, there's a place for you to keep track of bias and um, sampling methods, just all the vocab and examples we talked about today. I know it's a lot of vocab, and I know it's weird to be in a math class where there's like no calculations at all, but it's really important because if we collect trash data, we're going to get trash analysis. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't matter how good our analysis is. If the data that came in was trash, our results are going to be trash. We want our results to be good. We want our results to be useful. So it's really important that any experiment or study we design has a good sampling method and as little bias as possible so that the results we eventually get are useful. <laughs>